ahead and hit record <clears throat> and talk about section 6.3 estimators and sampling distributions. <clears throat> so <clears throat> as I've noted about the chapter six material, uh, the last half of chapter six is quite theoretical in nature. Um, 6.3 is where that theory begins. <clears throat> and uh, it continues on into 6.4. Once the theory gets set in 6.4, we essentially use that theory uh, as the basis for the validity of uh, everything we do from uh, here on out. So <clears throat> before I go ahead and talk about the notion of what we call estimators and sampling distributions, I want to introduce a new metric. A metric is something like a mean or a standard deviation. It's the value you uh, place upon a sample or a population that measures it in some fashion. <clears throat> so this new metric is called a proportion. And let me give you an idea of what we mean by a proportion. Suppose we have a sample and in that sample, We'll make it very straightforward for our first example. We have 100 people. <clears throat> and out of those 100 people, <clears throat> 34 of them um, have taken statistics. It's really not important here what kind of sample it is. Um, <clears throat> what's important here is this notion that we can talk about the proportion, or in this case, the sample proportion <clears throat> the sample proportion of <clears throat> people who have taken statistics and it is a simple fraction <clears throat> I'm gonna use some funky notation that I'll define in just a moment. That is what we call a sample proportion. It is the proportion of the sample that has <clears throat> the particular characteristic in question. The characteristic in question here is that they have taken stats. <clears throat> so out of that 134 have taken stats, <clears throat> and this is our sample proportion. <clears throat> this thing over here is special notation that we use for a sample proportion. <clears throat> Believe it or not, we call this P hat because it's P with a uh, hat. <clears throat> so we're going to start to work with sample proportions and population proportions. They're somewhat similar to a mean or a standard deviation. It's something that uh, some samples will have, other samples won't. Depends on the type of data that was requested. So let's see, where am I? Moving some stuff around on my desk. Give me one note here. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to do is to give you uh, an actual definition of a sample proportion. So <clears throat> and it is the proportion. with a particular characteristic. P hat equals X over N. Very, very basic, comes from your sample. So <clears throat> this is a sample statistic like X bar or S. <clears throat> now, 
we have a population parameter that population parameter is P. That's the population proportion. And I think it would be instructive <clears throat> to take a look at an example here. Well, not an example, I should say a summary of where we are in terms of, of sample statistics versus population parameters. Uh, we've got quite a few under our belt now, and it might be instructive to uh, take a look at some of the main ones we've worked with so far. I'm going to have two lists. Sample statistic and the population parameter. <clears throat> and I'll begin with the mean, X bar and mu. We have the standard deviation, S and sigma. <clears throat> we had the variance, S squared and sigma squared. And now we've got the proportion, P hat and P. And of all the parameters that we look at this semester, this is one of the only ones that with the parameter is not a Greek letter like these guys up here. So there's no reason this couldn't have been uh, handed to us way back in chapter uh, three with the rest of the metrics, but it arrived here, so we'll use it. <clears throat> and there's others on this list, but really this is really the focus of the semester. So that's where we are. Now, here's the reason we're talking about sample statistics and population parameters. And before I go ahead and talk about um, some of the subtle detail, let me go ahead and, and share some more vocabulary uh, with you guys first. And this is a little bit, um, a little bit uh, out of uh, order from what the book does within the section, but I think it makes more sense following this discussion. So. <clears throat> I want to talk about what we call an estimator. It's a fundamental word. It's part of the chapter six vocabulary. By the way, I've been redoing the vocabulary reviews, the practice uh, quizzes, and hopefully they're a little bit more easy to interpret. <clears throat> anyway, an estimator is a statistic. That would be a sample statistic <clears throat> that we use to what we call infer, basically estimate, or if you want to be blunt about it, perhaps just guess. <clears throat> so an estimator is a statistic that we use to infer the value of a population parameter. <clears throat> so what do we mean by that? <clears throat> X bar is an estimator of mu. <clears throat> so I take my sample mean and it is somehow used to guess at or to infer the value of mu, the population uh, mean. <clears throat> so this is what we mean by an estimator. Now, some estimators are better than others. An unbiased estimator, does a good job
I'm sorry, it's a little wordy. An unbiased estimator does a good job of estimating the underlying parameter. <clears throat> a biased estimator does a poor job of estimation. <clears throat> so some of the uh, sample statistics we encounter are good estimators, unbiased, some are biased. And I'll just give you a list. <clears throat> It'll come into play a little bit later in the semester. Our unbiased estimators, the proportion, p hat, and the mean, x bar, and the variance, s squared. Our biased estimators, the median, standard deviation, and the range. Now here's the interesting thing. <laughs> Just because some of the parameters are biased doesn't mean we don't use them to infer. <clears throat> we just take it with a grain of salt and we try to fix the bias, basically. So estimators, as I say, come in two distinctly different flavors. <clears throat> Flavor number one, the unbiased kind. Those little puppies there. <clears throat> Flavor number two, the bias term. <clears throat> now, quite honestly, all I really require is that students be able to identify bias versus unbiased estimators. <clears throat> now, the reason we actually use them, let's talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> and I'm going to work a very contrived example here. <clears throat> and uh, just work with me, and then I'll eventually, eventually get to the uh, important definition. So, so let's consider that we have a population and that population consists of the values one, one, three, and nine. That'll work. All right. <clears throat> now, usually we do not know the entire population here. It's kind of important to take away that curtain for the example, otherwise it's a little too tedious. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to sample from that population. And our sample size is going to be N equals four. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. No, bad Chris. N equals three. There we go. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all possible samples with n equals three. It's not hard to do because my population has only four members. Uh, each of the samples loses a different one of those numbers. And then I generate the entire list. So the first sample, one, one, three. There's no nine. The second sample, the second one, the three, and the nine. <clears throat> the third sample, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, oh, the one, the one, and the nine, the three stays home. And then in the final sample, wait, I think that might be it. <clears throat> it's often hard to come up with all possibilities. Fortunately, and I know a quick way. Uh, if we have four and we choose three, 
This will tell me how many, because I don't care the order in which we uh, get the numbers, how many we're supposed to have. So four math probability, choose three. Yeah, there should be four, I'm missing one of them. Ones. Oh, I'm sorry. I got the one, the three, the nine. I need the other one, <clears throat> the three and the nine. I didn't actually repeat, there's two ones. So this is one of the ones, this is the other one of the ones. There we go. That's why this is why, by the way, it can be a little confusing. Now, <clears throat> what I'm gonna do is I'm going to find the means of all of those different samples. This is sample one, two, three, and four. I'm going to take one decimal place. It's not hard to do. Let's see. One plus one is two plus three is five. So five divided by three. <clears throat> mean one is 1.7. Uh, 12 and one is 13 divided by three. Uh, one and one is 10 and one, 11 divided by three for uh, sample. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that one. Next, I want to do this one. Uh, so let's, oh, it's the same, 4.3. And finally, my fourth sample has a mean of, let's see, uh, nine, 10, and 11, 11 divided by three, <clears throat> 3.7. All right, so. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in that page. So let me summarize on a piece of clean paper. So we have our population. <clears throat> nine, uh, one, one, three, nine. And then we'll sample with size N equals three. X bar one equals 1.7, X bar two equals 4.3, X bar three equals 4.3, and X bar four equals, or is it 3.7? There we go. All right. So for my samples of size N equals three, this here is what we call the sampling distribution for the mean. And we did that when n was equal to, right, n equals three. <clears throat> this sampling distribution for the mean is a very, very important concept. Hence, this is a really important sort of notion and definition, if you, if you like. <clears throat> You'll notice that for a given sample size, I took all possible samples of that size from my population. And for each one, I found the mean. This is the sampling distribution. <clears throat> now, Here's the interesting thing about the sampling distribution. <clears throat> because I did not take the entire, <clears throat> the entire population when I took my sample, the actual population mean, add those numbers up, I get 14, divide that by three, I get an actual mean of 4.7. That's my population mean. <clears throat> so you notice that none of my sample means exactly captured the value of the population mean. <clears throat> Couple of them are kind of close. One of them is a, not so close and one of them is actually quite far away. <clears throat> so a sampling distribution will gather up sample means in this case and those sample means will kind of cluster around the true population mean.
<clears throat> your book is a little confusing on this particular uh, <clears throat> on this particular uh, point because honestly, your book is trying is is really trying to cover some very sophisticated and advanced mathematical theory without making us be grad students in math. Believe me, I've been there and done that, and it is a challenge. So this is what we call the sampling distribution for the mean. Let me give you the actual definition, and then we'll talk a little bit about how these things play out. Okay, so we have the sampling <clears throat> distribution for the mean. <clears throat> and it's basically, it's the distribution of all possible means It's the distribution of all possible sample means of a given size n. <clears throat> and we can take a look at that in a number of different ways. Uh, you saw me list them right there on the previous uh, page or two. Uh, we could make, uh, if we had enough of them, we could make histograms. Uh, believe it or not, we have uh, an exercise coming up, uh, an extra credit exercise coming up that will do just that. Um, and uh, we'll go on from there. So the sampling distribution for the mean. Now, we also have one for the <clears throat> proportions, standard deviations, variances, etc. <clears throat> Any one of those metrics that I mentioned at the beginning of the discussion. Uh, could be turned into a sampling distribution if we looked at all possible samples of a given size. That's really the key for all of these. We want all possible samples of a given size. And the reason that we, now let me bring that back for just a second. Now, let me uh, give it a push. So, When we have lots of samples, it doesn't work well for the example I use. We didn't have really enough samples. There were only a total of four. <clears throat> when we have lots of samples, <clears throat> we can make a histogram. <clears throat> and for example, our particular our particular uh, histogram for my example would look something like this. <clears throat> there is uh, one at 1.7. There is one at 3.7. And there are two at 4.3. <clears throat> So we can make a histogram. Uh, for my example, it doesn't work so well. It's really just not enough, uh, not enough samples really to get a reasonable picture. But here's the thing. And this is what, we, uh, what we're going to be able to leverage and work with. When n is big enough, 
and <clears throat> we have lots of samples some statistics form a normal distribution. And this is really going to be key for uh, the material that comes up in 6.4. So <clears throat> now, When n is greater than 30, <clears throat> and I'm going to go into this a little bit more detail uh, tomorrow and again on Thursday, <clears throat> but when n is greater than Thursday, <clears throat> the sampling distributions for the mean and proportion are approximately normal. <clears throat> if we were to make a histogram for our X bars, not our Xs, we would get something that was pretty gosh darn close to a normal histogram. And that's actually what we're going to, uh, what we're going to see, <clears throat> what we're gonna see when we do our little, uh, project uh, now that'll be sending around later this week. <clears throat> so they tend to form uh, they tend to form histograms that uh, are very well approximated by a normal distribution. <clears throat> Most of the means would be centered around some middle value. Only a few of the means would be far from that middle value. And this middle value here would end up being very close to mu. <clears throat> and this is also true for the sampling proportion for the population proportion, sorry, sampling distribution for the population proportion. <clears throat> and by the way, you've got to have a nice random sample. <clears throat> if n is greater than 30, and we're finding our population proportions, I'll get the same general pattern. It won't be a perfect histogram of a perfect bell curve, but it will be very, very close. And again, it will cluster around the true population proportion P. Remember that guy there, that's our population proportion. <clears throat> One of the problems with statistics is the letter P gets used way too often. Um, that's a lowercase p that we have here. Believe it or not, there's another P on the horizon beginning in chapter eight, and it's an uppercase P, it's a probability. But in any case, the uh, sampling distribution for P hat for the sample proportion, if I categorize them all, made them into a little histogram, I'd see something that looks approximately like this, provided n is greater than 30, and I've got enough of these little guys to work. So <clears throat> to summarize uh, where we are here, and 6.3, by the way, is, is a difficult section. I know I've said that for students. Take a look at the material, take a look at the homework. Uh, the homework is, is kind of neither here nor there. You'll see what I mean when you take a look at it. it um, some of this topic honestly could have been folded into chapter six, I think. 
and it might have gone a bit smoother. People often end up coming out of five, uh, sorry, 6.3 going, uh, what was I supposed to know? <clears throat> now that'll be tied up uh, once we get uh, once we get into uh, chapter seven, but for now it's a bit of an open book. So, <clears throat> so far we've got this notion of estimators. They can be biased or unbiased. <clears throat> Those estimators are things like x bar, p hat, s squared, etc. <clears throat> then I introduced introduce the notion of a sampling distribution for, and there were a couple of them that we took a look at a mean, x bar, and a proportion p hat. And there's probably one in there also for a variance. <clears throat> Ooh, variance s squared. But, uh, but we'll talk about the variance at a different point in time. Now, the reason we have this notion of a sampling distribution is this. This is why we're going down this road. So, in statistics, we wish to study populations. That is really the underlying thrust of our, uh, <clears throat> of our study. We want to be able to say something about a population. But the problem is this. <clears throat> Populations are too big to measure. So there's my population with an unknown mean mu. No idea what it is. I don't even care what we're measuring here. That's not the point. The point is the story. So we wish to study populations and they are just too gosh darn big to measure. <clears throat> we have an unknown mean mu. There is one thing I can measure to like any level of sophistication or accuracy I wish. And that is my sample <clears throat> with a known mean x bar. So <clears throat> what is this x bar? That x bar is an estimator. <clears throat> and what does it estimate? Estimates mu. Now, <clears throat> this whole notion of a sampling distribution comes down to this guy here. How many samples am I going to have? I have just one sample. Which one did I get? Did I get one of those sample means that was close to the true population mean, like 4.3 in my little silly example? Or maybe I got a mean that was far from the true population mean. The 1.3 is quite far from that true population mean of 4.7 or whatever the heck it was. <clears throat> so which one did I get? To somehow be able to answer this question, <clears throat> I have to understand the distribution because <clears throat> at the end of the day, it's a probability question. And understanding the underlying distributions <clears throat> for the samples x bar 
or the sample mean x bar is what's going to help me answer this question. <clears throat> which one did I get? <clears throat> I know which is misspelled. <clears throat> and that is really what section 6.4 uh, is set up to address. We have a special theorem. It's called the central limit theorem. I'm not going to write anything about it here. <clears throat> I'm going to wait until tomorrow. Uh, but you can help yourself out an awful lot by reading section 6.3 and 6.4 uh, before tomorrow's lecture. Um, it'll be very, very confusing. Uh, but believe me, it's uh, much easier to start with that and build off of that than uh, to try to go the other way. So this is why we want to look at uh, sampling distributions. This is why I want to know if my estimator is biased versus unbiased. I want to know what I have to do to estimate this guy here to some level of accuracy. Remember, it's an estimator. All it's going to be able to do is help me estimate. <clears throat> but I can get pretty darn close at least on a probabilistic basis. All right, that brings me to the end of section 6.3. So I'm gonna stop my recording. <clears throat>